story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, September 2nd. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. A man had jumped from a downtown 10-story building. We checked what evidence we had, but we were still unable to get an identification. Before we could proceed with the investigation, we had to know who he was and why he jumped. Scott, you seen Frank around? He was supposed to meet me here. Just passed him in the hall. Communications. Said he'd be right back. Thanks. They keeping you busy? Oh, about the same. A little hectic around the house, though. Yeah, that's right. Frank mentioned something about that. You're getting ready for a wedding out at your house, aren't you? Yeah, my daughter Alice. She's getting a nice fellow. That's so? Yeah. Ambitious boy. Smart. He's a part-time accountant. Goes to law school at night down in Loyola. Real nice fellow. That's good. When are they getting married? A week from Saturday. My wife finally got her way. It's going to be a big church thing. Sure glad it doesn't happen often. Well, you should have had all boys, Gotch. You're going to give your daughter away, I suppose. Yeah. Say, that reminds me. I've got to be sure and send my suit to the cleaners. Get a good press job on it. Sure is funny. What is? Seems the wife's been afraid for years we'd never get Alice married off. Now it's finding in the works, the wife's still unhappy. Oh, how's that? Oh, she goes moping around the house, dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief. Keeps muttering something about losing a little girl, a little girl's leaving her. I don't know. Well, how old's your daughter, Alice? Thirty-two. Well... Guess I better get started on this. Hi. Frank, what's doing? How'd you do on that jumper? Nothing. Don't make on the prints, huh? No, a couple of laundry marks on his clothes. We're checking them out. Yeah. Anything else doing? No. Say, they just posted the list inside, the annual physical exams. Am I on it? Sure, both of us. We're supposed to report to room 19 at the academy, Monday, 10 o'clock. Who's doing the examinations? Dr. Severn. Oh. What's the matter? Well, he's the one that checked me over last year. Told me to take off some weight. I haven't lost an ounce. I thought you were on a diet. I am, Joe. You even got one of those little calorie gizmos. You know, it tells you how many calories and everything. Yeah, I heard of them. Doesn't do any good. I'm still gaining. Well, it seems to me if you keep count, you should lose some weight. You know me in addition, Joe. How about some lunch, huh? Hot shot. I got it. Well, here's one to roll out. I'll meet you out there. What is it? Stage Hotel, room 12. Yeah? Looks like murder. <laughs> a.m. We located the Stage Hotel on West Howard Street, half a dozen blocks from the city hall. It was in the heart of the Skid Row District, a white stucco building, three stories. We identified ourselves to the manager of the hotel, a Mrs. Lorraine Washburn. She led the way up a flight of stairs to the second floor. The hallway was dingy. Down at the end on the left was room 12. We went in. The room was crowded with furniture, bric-a-brac, odds and ends. The walls were covered with pictures of old-time vaudeville stars, autographed programs, and theatrical posters. In the center of the room was an open steamer trunk full of costumes and bundles of news clippings. It looked like it had been ransacked. Tied to a chair was the body of a woman. She looked to be about 30 years of age, red hair. She'd been badly beaten about the face and head. Near the body was an empty wine bottle, a pair of broken glasses, and a length of steel pipe about 10 inches long. There were blood stains on it. Frank put in a call to the office and then to the crime lab. The landlady identified the victim as Thelma Porter. We asked the landlady what time she discovered the body. About 11.40 this morning. Just where it is now, Sergeant. Nothing's been touched. I haven't mentioned it to anyone in the hotel. Poor thing. How long had the victim been staying here at the hotel, Miss Washburn? Thelma? Oh, at least two years. Maybe a little more than that. Isn't it a terrible thing? It just doesn't make sense. How do you mean, ma'am? Thelma didn't have any money. 
You're just like most of the people I have here, stage folks. They're all older people. Most of them don't work too often, live from hand to mouth most of the time. I see. Did Thelma Porter live in this room here alone? Yes, that's right. This is a thing, though. Thelma used to be married. Her husband died in the East about ten years ago, I think. Name was Carl. Thelma and Carl. There used to be an old vaudeville team, the two of them. Rose and Bernard. Did the Porter woman have many friends here at the hotel, ma'am? Oh, yes. She knew everybody. All my people are friendly with each other. Most of them are permanent. I guess we'll have to tell all of them about this. Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid so. And Miss Washburn, when was the last time you saw Mrs. Porter? I mean, before this morning, of course. Just after midnight last night. I was sitting down in the lobby of eating, just about to go to bed. Thelma came in with George Steele. He's a friend of Thelma's, lives here in the hotel. Mm-hmm. Thelma said good night and came upstairs here to her room. George and I sat a bit and talked, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Then this morning, I was taking the fresh lemon around to the rooms. Knock on Thelma's door, but she didn't answer. Finally opened up with the pass key. There it was. Now, this George Steele that Mrs. Porter came in with, had she been out on a date with him, would you know? No, not exactly. You see, Thelma spent quite a bit of time at a bar down the street, Jack Hanley's place. She was there five, six nights every week. I see. George dropped in for a bottle of beer, had one with Thelma, I guess. Then the two of them came back to the hotel together. Did she have any visitors last night, do you know? No, sir, I don't. Does she have any enemies that you might know of, maybe somebody she didn't get along with? No, nobody I know of. And you can't think of a reason why anybody would want to kill her? I don't know. Maybe somebody thought she had money. She didn't. Not even enough to bury her. I don't know what's going to happen. Pancho? Hi, Don. Hi. Don, this is Mrs. Washburn, the manager. How do you do, Mr. Washburn? How do you do? What is this? Crime lab crew on the way over? Yeah, they won't be here in a minute. Will you be needing me anymore, Sergeant? Can I go now? We've got a few more questions we'd like to ask you, ma'am, if you don't mind. Well, it's quite a shock, you know. Terrible thing to have happen. Yes, ma'am. Such a terrible thing. All mixed up. I'm going to have to explain. What's that, ma'am? Thelma. She was three weeks behind in her rent. I carried her on the books. The owner of the hotel is going to want the rent money. It's going to have to come from someplace. Well, how did Mrs. Porter live? Didn't she have any income at all? She worked occasionally. Odd jobs. Then she'd have the unemployment insurance. Even that ran out on her two or three weeks ago. I see. There's no reason in the world for it, Sergeant, killing Thelma. She wasn't too young or very pretty. She wasn't worth anything. She didn't even have a decent coat to go out in. Yes, ma'am. That trunk over there, full of papers. That's all she had. What sense does that make? I don't know, ma'am. We haven't started checking yet. Her clothes, a couple of scrapbooks. Nobody kill her for that. Pile of old news clippings. I don't know. It's been done for less. I continued to interview the landlady, Mrs. Washburn. She told me that the victim had quite a few male acquaintances that she'd met at neighborhood bars. She gave me the names of all those she knew of. 12.45 p.m. Sergeant J. Allen and the crew from the crime lab arrived. The body and the murder room were photographed from all angles. Dean Bergman processed everything in the room for latent fingerprints. The place was gone over thoroughly for further physical evidence. The only thing that didn't seem to belong in the room was the apparent murder weapon, a 10-inch length of steel pipe found beside the body. 1.05 p.m. After we put in a call to the coroner's office, we started checking with the residents of the hotel. No one gave us any direct leads to the killing, but more than a half a dozen of them told us that Mrs. Porter had been in the habit of making vague remarks about what she kept in that steamer trunk in her room. She made a point of never opening the trunk for anyone, and she hinted constantly, even in public, that she kept something of value inside. 4.45 p.m. We started checking out the list of the murdered woman's friends, which Mrs. Washburn and the tenants had given us. It went slow. We got little or nothing from the first dozen names on the list. 9.50 p.m. We went back to the office. Well, we've had better days, that's for sure. It's a lousy start. It couldn't be going much slower. We must have logged 40 miles of legwork. Nothing to show for it. Mm. All right, Guy. All right, how'd you do? Not much. How about you and McCready? We checked out 10 names on the list, the Porter woman's friends. The only thing they could tell us we already knew. That business about the steamer trunk, Mrs. Porter hitting around, she had something valuable in it. Mm, where's that leave us? We've got a fair motive to go on. The crime lab called just before you came in. They get anything? No latent prints. They went over that steamer trunk, though, found a hundred shares of some kind of mining stock sold in the liner of the trunk. Worth anything? Not the paper it's printed on. Never was worth anything, according to the broker who checked it. I got the blow-ups. Want to take a look at them? Yeah, thanks. Why 
wine bottle. It's a wine drinker. Well, it looks like he stepped on their glasses and broke them. Sure brutal, isn't it? Sure prowled the trunk, didn't he? It sets up the motor pretty well. The Porter woman spent plenty of time at bars. She had a lot of men friends. We know she did a lot of talking about the nest egg she was supposed to have locked up in that trunk. So one of her boyfriends believed her, went up to have a look through the trunk, didn't know she was in the room, had to kill her. It's a good possibility. Oh, we got the word from the coroner's office, by the way. Yeah, what'd they have to say? Cause of death was multiple skull fractures. They're sure they linked the pipe as a murder weapon. Mrs. Porter died about 4 a.m., they figure. Killer sure gave her a vicious beating. Looks like more legwork, huh? I wish it was an easier way. For every bar she drank at, everybody she talked to, we'll have to check them all. You know, there's just one thing that's got me stopped, Joe. Yeah, what's that? Tell me, Porter. Don't you think she had an idea that mining stock was worthless? Well, I guess she did. Why'd she hang on to it? Why did she even keep the stock around? I don't know, gosh. The only thing she had left were the scrapbooks, a couple of theater posters. Yeah. She knew they'd never pay off. Gotch and McCready, we went back to the West Howard Street neighborhood and started checking down the list of people known to the dead woman. One of them was a Miss Babs Sheldon, a singer in a small cabaret on the corner of West Howard and Pacheco. We went back to a small dressing room where we questioned the Sheldon girl. She said she'd known the victim for about five years. I kept telling Tommy to get out of that hotel. Living with those husbands wasn't any good for her. Do you know of any steady boyfriends she might have had recently, Miss Sheldon? No, not Thelma. She couldn't get interested in any man after Carl died, her husband. That's what she told me anyway. There used to be a great vaudeville team, you know, she and her husband. Yes, ma'am, we know. Rose and Bernard. That's the way they were billed. You ever hear of them? Fine acrobatic routine. No, afraid not. Did Miss Porter ever mention anything to you about a steamer trunk that she kept in the room? Anything about what she kept in that trunk? No, not to me she didn't. It was a kind of a standing gag with people who knew Thelma. She was kind of funny about it. In what way? No, Thelma was a great talker, you know. Oh, this Princess Thelma. Thelma told everybody about her business. Talk to Blue Street. Uh-huh. She'd talk about her life, her personal affairs, especially when she had a few drinks. But I don't think I ever heard her mention to anybody what she had in that trunk. She'd hint around about it, call her a gold mine, but she'd never once let anyone see what was in that trunk. Not once. I'll leave you one of our cars, Miss Sheldon. If you happen to hear anything else that might help us, we'd appreciate it if you give us a call. Such a terrible mess. I don't know why it had to happen now. Lord knows what I'll look like at the funeral. Ma'am. I haven't got a decent black dress to my name. One a.m. We checked back into the office to a prearranged meeting set up with Gotch and McCready. Hi. Gotch. Anything? Pretty small. How about you? Might have something. Can't tell. Where's McCready? Down in the carpool. There's a bar down on Main Street, left-hand side. Yeah. Porter woman used to go there quite a bit, according to the bartender. Most of the regular customers know her. Uh-huh. The bartender told us he overheard a conversation in one of the booths four or five nights ago. Three winos. We got their names. What about them? Bartender says they were talking about Thelma Porter. Yeah. He says he heard one of the men say she keeps the trunk in her room. We can break it open. <laughs> September 3rd, 8 a.m. We rounded up and took into custody the three men who'd been overheard while apparently planning a burglary of the murder victim's hotel room. Together with Sergeant Jack Gotch and Sergeant Jack McCready, Frank and I had little trouble locating the three men and bringing them in for questioning. They were fairly well known along Skid Row and they immediately took the attitude that they had nothing to hide. We went along with them. We questioned them individually and together. Meantime, their rooms were being searched. No leads. Two of the men were brothers, John Parkson and Arnold Parkson. The third man was Harold Young. All three listed their occupations as part-time laborers, unemployed. All three had records. Vagrancy, disorderly conduct, petty theft. We questioned Harold Young first. Then Arnold Parkson. They both had alibis. Their stories made sense. No conflicting statements. We interrogated the other Parkson brother, John. Same result. Well, it could have been, yeah. That trunk of Thomas was kind of a gag around town. You know. We act about it a lot. Everybody kidded about it. We even used to rib Thelma. Tell her we're going to break in it some night. Find all the loot she had put away. Just a gag. I'm going to tell you something. 
We told this to the other two. We got an idea it was more than a gag in the case of you three. We got evidence to back that up. If you want to add anything more to your story, now's the time to do it, fella. I don't think I'm getting the pitch right, Sergeant. I told you everything. I don't know what kind of evidence you got, but I'm clean. I know that much. Maybe I booze it up some, but I don't run with heavies. Murder's way out of my line. That's your story, huh? What else can I tell you? Go. What do you think, Colonel? Well, let's let him wait around for a while. We might get something out of him. Just thinking, if we can get a bug in one of the offices, it might get something. Maybe. It's a long way around. Well, there's nothing much else we can do. Think there's a chance? It's a small one. Let's don't count too much on it. We checked with Captain Lorman's office, and we got permission to have the office bugged. We put in a call to the crime lab and asked them to install listening equipment in the captain's office as soon as possible. They told us that they'd have the sound crew go to work on it immediately. Under the pretext of further questioning, Sergeant Jack Gotch and Frank took the suspects down the hall to the interrogation room where they would be held until the sound men could finish rigging up the equipment. equipment and two sets of earphones were set up in the locker section off the squad room so that we could monitor the conversation between the two suspects. First, we had the two Parkson brothers, John and Arnold, placed alone in the captain's office. We listened to them talk between themselves for half an hour. They didn't say so directly, but we caught inferences that each brother doubted the other's innocence of the film of Porter killing. At 1.30 that afternoon, we took Arnold Parkson from the captain's office and had Harold Young take his place. sure about it here, eh? I won't. You're not mixed up in it. The killing. What do you mean, am I sure of it? I told you. Just be sure, that's all. I don't want any part of it, Yeah. Yeah, well, you be sure, too. You and your brother. You always look at me when something happens. Dog will say me and my brother. We've never been in any heavy stuff. Killings. No part of it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We shouldn't be talking about killings in here. Why not? Sometimes the cops wire these rooms. Oh, you're out of your mind. You've been reading too much fiction. Yes, they do. They can hear everything you say. They don't have time to wire anything. I've been here all day. I'm going to look around. I'm taking no chances. I don't want to get involved in anything. Sometimes they hide the mic in files or any place you can't see it. You're crazy. I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to check everywhere. Sometimes they put them on the chairs. What do they do, broadcast it? Where's the wire? They had the mic on the edge of a desk. I've heard of that, too. Let's see. Better get in there. Yeah. What are you doing there? I could hear you clearing the other office, going through the files. I thought I told you to stay put in that chair. Yes, sir. Why aren't you there? Sit down. If I'd have wanted you to prowl the office, I'd have told you. Now, both of you, stay put in those chairs, you understand? Get 
You know, I think I'll hit the road and get out of here. L.A. is no good this time of year. The valley's better up around Fresno. You'll have to go alone if you go. Fresno's nothing. I'm staying here. Nobody asked you to come. I don't think I like this partner deal anyway. I like to travel alone, just me and nobody else. What's the matter? You think you got a raw deal? We made out, ain't we? Sure, sure, we made out. I just want to go to the valley, that's all. All this cop trouble, I don't like it. Maybe you think I do. They talked me over more than they did you. Yeah, well, I don't care. I don't like it. I'm getting out of here. What's the pitch, Harry? You got nothing to cover up for, have you? What do you mean, cover up? Of course not. I want to jump this town, that's all. Something wrong in it? You started talking about getting in the trunk the other night. Water dame's trunk. You're crazy. Your brother Arnie did. Oh, it was you, I remember. You sure about that killing, Harry? You weren't in it? Listen, don't go talking to me like that. I never started any talk about getting in the trunk. And what are you getting mad about, huh? I didn't say anything. All right. I'm trying to get smart, that's all. Asking me about the killing. I was in bed. Don't try getting smart with me. All right, you're so sure. What are you getting mad for? I was sleeping in the bed, and you know it. Trying to get smart. How am I so sure it wasn't you? It could have been. Sure, it could have been all of us. Let's forget it. All right, all right, all right. I just want to keep it straight, that's all. You got a smoke? Yeah. Haven't had any since this morning. Lousy cops. I'm going to read them off. Sure. I think they have something on us. Keeping us cooped up in here. Yeah. Some dame gets knocked off. Why do they have to check on us? Tell them. Tell you what we need is a lawyer. All this trouble over that dame. Yeah. That trunk of hers. All she could talk about, what she had in the trunk. Nothing in it anyway. Old papers. Huh? Old papers. How do you know what was in it? You're crazy. I didn't say anything. You said old papers. You said there wasn't anything in the trunk. You opened her room. You saw her. You're crazy, Harry. Shut you up. saw her and you killed her. Shut up. Oh, no. All right, that's enough. Come on. That's you, enough. It's him. He knew about the trunk. He killed her. He's lying, lying. Can't you see that? He's lying. Yeah, that's enough. He knew about the trunk, Sergeant. He was sitting there. He said, old papers, old papers in the trunk. He must have killed her. He's lying. Trying to cover up. That's what he's trying to do. He's lying. Look, there's a dictaphone in the room. We heard you. No, you didn't. It's recorded. We'll play it back for you. Yeah? That's right. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean any of it. She wasn't supposed to be in her room. It wouldn't have happened if she wasn't there. All right, why'd you do it? I don't know. I just wanted to see what was in that trunk. She was going to scream, so I hit her with a pipe. She was suffering, so I killed her. I didn't want her to suffer. Just one thing on top of another. When I went there, I didn't even think about killing her. I just wanted to see what was in the trunk. I just wanted to look. I had to find out. I guess you know. Papers. Old pieces of newspapers, that's all. December 7th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. Further investigation proved that Harold Young and Arnold Parkson were not implicated in the crime, and they were released from custody. <laughs>